You can sit and watch the moon rise over Clara and watch the sun go down on Galway Bay just to hear again the ripple of the trout stream. The women in the meadows making hay and to sit beside the turf fire in the cabin and watch the barefoot gossips at their play. For the breezes blowing o'er the seas from Ireland they're perfumed by the heather as they blow. And the women in the uplands digging praises speak a language that the strangers do not know. For the strangers came and tried to teach us their way. They scorned us just for being what we are. But they might as well go chasing after moonbeams or light a penny candle from a star. And if there is going to be a life hereafter And somehow I am sure there's going to be I will ask my Lord to let me make my heaven In that dear land across the Irish Sea The Irish Sea. By a lonely prison wall I heard a young girl calling Michael, they are taking you away For you stole Trevelyan's corn So the young might see the morn now a prison ship lies waiting in the bay. a lonely prison wall, she heard her young man calling. Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free. Against the famine and the crown, I rebelled, they ran me down. Now you must raise our child with dignity. Though I, the fiends of 
laugh and rhyme where once we watched the small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams and songs to sing. It's so lonely round the fields, laugh and rhyme. Cry alone. She watched her last star falling as the prison ship sailed out against the sky. Sure, she'll wait and hope and pray for her love in Bodney Bay. It's so lonely. Round the fields, laugh and rhyme. Oh, the fields of Athen rhyme, where once we watched the small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams. And songs to sing. It's so lonely round the fields of Athen Rhine. Though I, the fields of Athen Rhine, where once we watched the small. It's so lonely round the fields of Athens. Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses fall. Tis you, tis you, must go, and I must buy. But come ye back when the summer's in the meadows, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. But when ye come, and all the flowers are dying. If I am dead, as dead.
dead. Well, maybe. Please come and find the place where I am lying. And kneel and say, and offer there for me. And I shall hear those soft you tread above me. And all my crave will warmer, sweeter be. For you shall be Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis McNeil. Welcome to this celebration of Peter's life. Such a special dear friend of so many of us for so, so many years. At this time, we're about to begin the Mass. So if you might pull out your electronic beepers, cell phones, and um, make sure they're in the silence mode or off for the Mass. That would be a great idea. We're going to start the Mass shortly with the song Amazing Grace. Hopefully you know most of the words and we'll sing loud and honor Peter as he would want you to sing.
this time, would you all please stand and face the back of the church? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. And grace will lead me home. Has grace appeared? When grace appeared, <coughs> the hour I first believed through many days. And grace will lead us home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. 
I would like to begin with a public word of thanks to Father Gill for his gracious welcome and also to thank Monsignor Turgeson from St. Monica's, who is the patriarch of the West Side over here, for being here. We should begin our prayer with the spirit of St. Paul's, which is a welcoming spirit. And therefore, following the best traditions of our church, I bless and welcome each and every one of you in a special way to draw into our welcoming those among us who are non-Catholics. Thank you for teaching us that God is greater than any one church, that God speaks in many languages, and God was revealed in diverse ways. And when we come together as one people, diverse in belief, in life choice, in life practice, but one in belonging, only then can we truly call ourselves God's people. And I bless you and I welcome you as God's people in a special way to call by name Merle and Brian and Kelly, Darcy and Matt, Tim and Rebecca, Ted and Jacqueline, and Jessica. And also to draw into our recognition the grandchildren who are among us. Please also to include Michael and Marianne, Jennifer, and Patrick, who because of ill health could not be here. In the waters of baptism, Peter died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. And we bless his ashes with the holy water, which reminds us of his baptism, of which St. Paul writes, all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death and resurrection. When Peter was baptized, he was clothed in a white garment, a sign that he was born into Christ. We now clothe his ashes with this white garment, a sign that he is now reborn into eternal life. Let us pray. O oh God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant Peter, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice in the new and full life in God's presence. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. We shall now listen to some words in eulogy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear my voice and, and uh, have a kind of a Robert Kennedy voice. I like to make it a little, it may struggle a little bit with you as we go on. Uh, thank you very much, Monsignor, for those introductions. Um, and I'm looking forward to your beautiful Mass and homily to honor our good friend, Peter Mullen. I'm saddened to be here for Peter's memorial, but I'm pleased to be back to St. Paul's. Uh, it was a very important church in our relationship here in this community. Mon and I lived in Century City, and although we were in St. Timothy's, uh, we often came here for our Masses because Peter and I had a dear friend, a very close friend from the Paulus, a gentleman by the name of Elwood Kaiser. We called him Bud, um, and he was also known as the Hollywood priest uh, because he headed up Paulus Productions, a famous Hollywood production company over in uh, West LA. But uh, Bud lived just across the street from here, and Peter and I served on his Board of Advisors for Paulus Productions. I've been asked to share some thoughts about Peter, uh, but before I do, I'd like to read his children's recollections about their father. I've been asked to uh, share with you 
before I speak about my own thoughts. Let me start with uh, Brian, the oldest. When I was younger, on weekends, Dad and I would take a car out for a long drive through Sepulveda Pass, up through the valley, over Canaan Doom, down PCH, to our typical Sunday destination, Gladstones. He always asked me what we should take, and without fail, it was a 1971 Ferrari Daytona. We came back from college my freshman year, and we naturally went on our Sunday drive. We made it through the pass. He slowed the car down to a stop on the shoulder of the road, and he turned the car off and looked at me, smiled, and said, your turn. I waited for about five seconds looking at him, opened my mouth, and said, Dad, I don't know how to drive a stick. I was a wild firstborn son, and I don't think I've ever seen so much disappointment registered on his face. I vowed to turn it around. We've raced cars together over the last 25 years, and that instruction and the bravery required to pursue such a hobby has been a guide for life in the fast line. Take care of your helmet. Hit your apexes. Hard straight braking, approach a hairpin, but steady throttle and acceleration as you're unwinding in the turn. Don't worry about the guy behind you. You own the racing line, but you have to leave that line if you want to get past the guy in front of you. And I'm sure Brian did that many times during his racing career. You checked it, you, you got the checkered flag pop, see you in the winner's circle. And I think we all know where Peter's winner's circle is today. And we're all looking to join him someday in heaven. Recollections from Peter's daughter, Darcy. I can still envision my dad coming through our front door at the end of his work day, ready to take possession of the human tree. I climbed to mark his return. I ascended from his ankles to his shoulders hanging on for dear life until I completed the climb, happily victorious in his arms, having conquered the great oak that loomed in the middle of our blue shag entryway carpet. While it was just a game we played, our greeting at the end of the day, it was symbolic of who he was to me, a man who loomed large with an impressive stature, one who could be stoic and foreboding, but also enveloped me with a feeling of being buoyed and sheltered. As a child, I always felt loved and protected by my larger-than-life dad, and was so proud that he was my father. With an open, warm expression and easy smile, a quick wit, and a retort always at the ready, he was a favorite of my friends, their parents, my teachers, and others in my orbit. As life progressed, our relationship became more layered, sometimes close, other times more distant or even contentious. But this quality of human and playfulness always remained. He loved a good debate and was never short on advice, what we laughingly called the Pedroisms, and often quip, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? As he was in actuality interrupting a story and simultaneously commenting on a perceived interruption by another. Like many parents, his natural inclinations were to impart the wisdom he gained through his own life experience upon me and my siblings. This intent was noble, and one I share now as a parent myself, the desire to prepare your kids for real life, despite the fact that it sometimes felt more like correction than connection. Our story became full circle towards the end of his life, my dad's failing health, followed by the COVID pandemic, resulted in more frequent visits and longer discussions. This time allowed us to reconnect and also gave our kids an opportunity to get to know a grandfather they had not known intimately as children. Now they had a unique opportunity to get to know him in his adolescence. And who more needs a never-ending well of advice than a trio of adolescents? His attention, span was shorter, but it seemed his memory was longer. 
He talked to Mac about his new school and favorite subjects, Tate about her studies and her social life, Lachlan about his basketball training and college applications, and he remembered those discussions each time we came together. And during those visits, we all learned important lessons from one another. First, that leaving family, knowing that they were loved, may not require a lifetime of repetition. Second, that forgiveness and understanding were good for the soul. Third, that it's okay to go first and be vulnerable. And last, that it is never too late to build new memories. I love you, Dad. Now Tim's notes uh, to share with you. My dad had a treasure chest of knowledge that I was lucky to absorb. A few examples. One of the first lessons he taught me was, if you were ever bullied, look at the person laughing the hardest and laughed harder than them. There's a life lesson that I've carried across countless platforms. He said, self-deprecation is the best type of humor. It disarms and puts others at ease and you yourself are the only fall guy. What an insight. I remember overhearing him say to a coworker one time, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. I've never worn a watch that has not been set 10 minutes fast since then. Dad, I'm proud to be the docent of this museum of knowledge for this generation, to ingrain in my children all this knowledge and think proudly about it continuing to be passed down for generations to come. Now my thoughts about Peter. As we gather here today to bid farewell to a remarkable soul, we remember and honor a friend who enriched our lives in countless ways. Peter, my beloved companion for more than 50 years, has less an indelible mark on my heart and in the world around us. His legacy of friendship, generosity, wisdom, faith, Irish heritage, philanthropy, and leadership will forever be in our memories. Let me highlight each aspect of Peter's awesome legacy. Peter was a model of friendship, a steadfast and loyal companion through the highs and lows of life. For over five decades, over five decades, he stood by my side offering unwavering advice, love, and support. His laughter, warm smile, and the comfort of his presence will be deeply missed. His generosity knew no bounds, as evidenced by the annual gatherings he hosted at his, at his magnificent Scotland estate. These gatherings for the Scottish American Highland Games were more than just events. They were an embodiment of his hospitality and love for those dear to him. Peter had the unique ability to make each of us feel truly cherished and welcome. And I know there are others here that had the, the great fortune of attending those, those events. On my initial trip to Scotland for the Highland Games, I had my first taste of haggis and my last taste of haggis. And, and single malt after that, uh, after that, marching into the dining room at Peter's Thai Tour estate with a bagpiper leading the parade. A bagpiper from a friend of his in the neighborhood, uh, the Duke of Athol, and once in a while the Duke would come and join us for the celebration. After dinner, we would mosey over to Peter's Tavern for conversation, darts, billiards, and cards, and a little single malt scotch. After a short night of sleep, we would get up early for a day at the tennis courts, horseshoes, golf, shooting, or hunting. It was an awesome experience that I will never forget. Peter's wisdom was a guiding light in our lives. His insight was sought after and cherished. His advice invaluable. His Catholic faith and strong moral values were the cornerstones of his character. His faith was not merely a set of beliefs, but a wellspring of compassion and love that he poured into the lives of those around him. A proud bearer of Irish heritage, Peter wore it like a badge of honor. He embraced the rich culture, traditions, and history of Ireland, and his love for all things were infectious. All things Irish were infectious. 
He used his heritage as a bridge to connect with people from all walks of life. Every year, Peter, along with many friends, attended the annual St. Patrick's Day celebration in Los Angeles. The black tie event was held at the Hilton Hotel with wonderful Irish music and a room packed with Irish, or want to be Irish, gentlemen smoking cigars and drinking Irish whiskey. And although many think the name Ferry is an Irish name, it is not. And, uh, and I was one of the want to be's, you know, in the celebration. I used to joke about uh, my grandfather wanting to be Irish, so he changed his name uh, from Safara to Ferry. Uh, so my Italian heritage was lost, and I became Irish in Los Angeles. In the world of business, Peter was a force to be reckoned with. His acumen and vision led him to incredible success, not only for himself, but also for those fortunate enough to work alongside him. And there are some of you here tonight that have had that experience. He was a mentor to many, imparting knowledge and nurturing talent with the same generosity that defined his life. Peter gained internal or international esteem for his collection of antique French cars which he brought to life at the Mullen Automotive Museum. The museum embraced Peter's passion for the rolling sculptures with his love of Art Deco that created a collection that drew visitors from around the world. The extensive collection included many items that he and Merle gathered from all corners of the globe during their travels, ranging from paintings, sculptures, to furniture. Peter cherished every piece of his collection and appreciated them with his artist's eyes and incredible attention to detail. But his true joy was always in sharing all with others. He was undoubtedly one of the most successful life insurance executives in this country. And he was the founder and the leader of the M Financial Group, the premier life insurance distribution company in the U.S. In my 35 years in the executive recruiting field, I never met anybody more talented and more accomplished than Peter Mullen. Together, we embarked on journeys of philanthropy, dedicating our resources and time to causes close to our hearts. Peter's compassion knew no bounds, and he worked tirelessly to make the world a better place for those less fortunate. His determination and philanthropic endeavors was a testament to his commitment to leaving a positive impact on the world. Peter was not content with success in business alone. He also served on corporate and community boards, lending his expertise to shaping the destinies of the organizations and the communities they served. His extraordinary leadership was a beacon of inspiration to all who had the privilege of working with him. While we mourn his passing, we also celebrate the remarkable life he lived and the influence he had on all of us. Though he's no longer with us in person, I know he's here in spirit. His spirit lives on in our hearts and in the countless lives he's touched, creating a vibrant and enduring legacy. Peter will forever be remembered, remembered for his unwavering friendship, his boundless generosity, his profound wisdom, his unshakable faith, his rich Irish heritage, his exceptional business acumen, his dedication to philanthropy and extraordinary leadership. Peter was a man of all seasons. May his soul rest in peace, and may his memory continue to inspire us to be better friends, more generous souls, wiser individuals, and compassionate leaders. Farewell, dear friend, dear friend, until we meet again. I'm taking a line from one of my favorite Irish toasts, may God hold you in the palm of his hand until we meet again. Thank you, and God bless. A reading from the second book of Maccabees. Judas, the ruler of Israel, took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiatory service. 
In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection of the dead in view. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. But if he did this with a view of the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead, that they might be freed from this sin. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and place us with you in his presence. Everything indeed is for you, so that the grace bestowed in abundance on more and more people may cause the thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. Therefore, we are not discouraged, rather, Although our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to, to what is seen, but to what is unseen. For what is seen is transitory, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if our earthly dwelling, a tent, should be destroyed, we have a building from God. 
a dwelling not made with hands, eternal in heaven. The word of the Lord. Please stand. My sisters and my brothers, the Lord be with you. Our reading is from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. My sisters and brothers, the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. For these few moments in the liturgy, the invitation is to pause and reflect in homily. We already listened to a very eloquent, comprehensive eulogy from Richard. But for these few moments, it's a spiritual moment that's meant to speak not just the memories of Peter, but to speak to every one of us in some manner. Because everything that happens in life, your best moments and your worst moments, everything has a teaching. Sadly, I think it may well be that we miss many of the most important teachings in life because life is so busy. We have so many distractions. I came from South Pasadena this morning. I don't know how many miles it is from South Pasadena. I just know how long it takes to get here because that's the way we live. We live under the tyranny of a clock. We have so many distractions. Seldom do we stop the world and pause and reflect. That's meant to be the invitation of homily. We're not a listening culture. 
We don't listen to learn. We listen to respond. When you're halfway through your question, I have the answer, and my answer is to correct you. That's the culture in which we live. It's a divided culture. It's a broken culture. It's a culture of arrogant certainty. And then we come into the house of the Lord and we claim a quiet moment, a moment of silence. We'll call it a liminal moment. Liminal comes from a Latin word, limen, which means a threshold, where you stop, turn off the world, and listen to the teaching of the moment. Now, the gospel chosen for today comes from the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew, a Jewish gospel. And Matthew has Jesus going up in the mountain, he sits down, the rabbi always sat when he was teaching, and then he begins to speak. Matthew wants those who are listening to remember Mount Sinai, where God revealed, and now God is revealing again. And blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed, not a good translation. Sometimes you'll hear, happy are the poor in spirit. The Greek word is makarios, and makarios means inner peace, serenity. We, we speak about a conflicted spirit. We're divided, anxious, mad about something, or a spirit which is peaceful. That's makarios. Those special moments when you feel a, a wellness within your soul. You feel a certain security in God's divine providence. That's Makarios. So let me speak a little bit about that. Treat this as a liminal moment, a teaching moment. Now, in the spiritual conversations, we speak about the magna anima and the pusilla anima. The magna anima is the great soul. The Pusilla anima, the small soul. The great soul is generous, forgiving, understanding. The small soul is selfish, demanding, awkward, difficult. And everyone else has a great soul, the magna anima, and also every one of us has the Pusilla, the small soul. See, the great soul says, I have time. Come in, sit down, welcome. The small soul says, I'm busy, what do you have in your mind? Small soul. The great soul says, I forgive you. Without condition, small soul says, three strikes and you're out. The great soul gives a gift. The small soul says, you owe me. The great soul gives the gift freely. The great soul always has time. Not, not just time chronologically, but time of the heart, time to listen, time to understand, time to welcome. Sometimes, sometimes you'll find in yourself, I find in myself, the great soul at work. You meet me on a good day, I'm wonderful. I'm friendly, I'm joyous, I'll sing for you, I'll belong to you, I'll understand you, I'll give you time. Meet me on a bad day, I can be awkward, difficult. That's a small soul. So when we come to a liminal moment, this is a liminal moment. It's a threshold. We stop. And we think in a place of silence, we reflect, what is it that I am speaking from my small soul 
And how do I live out the large soul, the great soul? What wound am I carrying? What forgiveness am I withholding? What division am I causing? What misunderstanding is something I carry inside of me? And now I come to a liminal moment and I say, wow, I want to walk in peace. See, when we come to celebrate Peter's life, he had a great soul. He was generous. He cared for people. He reached out. He made a difference for good in many people's lives. But just like us, he had a small soul. And sometimes we live out the small soul, sometimes the great one. It's worth thinking about that. This is a liminal moment. Time to make a difference in your church, in your family. I read the sign that Father Gail has out in the front. He said, all are welcome here. The Hindu, the Muslim, the Hebrew, it doesn't matter. Gay, straight, wild, crazy. This is your spiritual home. That's the great soul. The small soul says you have to qualify. You don't fit. You don't belong. The invitation of this moment is to live out the great soul. Jean Paul Richter, this poet, has this to say. He says, two aged men who were foes for life stood by a grave and wept and their tears wiped away the strife of the years, and then they wept again for the years that were lost. Sometimes we're losing precious time with the small soul. So in tribute to Peter, carry from this moment in prayer, in the power of Jesus Christ, with whatever, whoever you have as your God, a desire to live out this day in the great soul. And now we hand Peter over to the Lord. The ultimate statement, the infinite, unconditional love of God expressed in Jesus Christ, secure in divine providence of infinite love, and Shakespeare put it this way, Brutus to Cassius on the field of Philippi. Here's his greeting. Farewell, my friend, farewell. If we meet again, we shall smile indeed. And if not, tis true, this parting is well made. Well, Peter, we shall meet again and we shall smile indeed because God is infinite love, the great soul. Amen. Please stand and we shall now offer our prayers of petition. reading the prayers of the Tim, Tim is going to read the prayers of petition. Okay, Tim. Oh. I think they're right here, Tim. One people, united in this moment, a moment of teaching, a moment of grace, a moment of hope, a moment of celebration, one people, we now, in confidence, offer these our prayers of petition. 
The response to our petitions is, Lord, hear our prayer. For Peter, who was in baptism, was given the pledge of eternal life that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear, Lord, hear our prayer. For our brother Peter, who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that he may be raised up on the last day, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear, Lord, hear our prayer. For our deceased relatives, that they may rest in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the family and friends of our brother Peter, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the unhoused and unwanted, the elderly and homebound, and all who care for them, may the Lord give them his care and protection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace in the Holy Lands, for those killed and wounded, for an end to the ancient hatreds and divisions in the Lord's vineyard, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In the power of God's Spirit, we make these prayers in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. And blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. My sisters and brothers, pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. God of love, spirit of life, bind us together 
in a community of true discipleship, of caring, of belonging, understanding, and of patience, of shared faith. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right. Really right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. In him, the hope of a blessed resurrection has dawned. For those who believe the sadness of death gives way to the bright promise of immortality, life is changed, not ended. And when we meet this moment in the glory of God's presence, we sing our unending hymn of praise. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts like the dew fall, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time of his betrayal, as he entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup and once again gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until Therefore, as we celebrate this memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence, to minister to you. Humbly we pray that, sharing in the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Jose, our Bishop, and all your holy people. Remember Peter, who called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his may be one with him in resurrection. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, with the blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles, St. Paul, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. May we merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. May praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, 
In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. We come together as one family and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all distress as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. With your spirit. Bless one another with the sign of Christ. In a few moments, we will have our communion, our sharing in the Eucharist. A widely celebrated practice in many, many churches, including St. Paul's and St. Monica's, and where I come from at Holy Family, at communion time is to be open and inviting and show hospitality. We are blessed in our church. We are enriched in our church. When people who choose not to receive the Eucharist come and pray with us. It's not part of their prayer, their religious belief or their practice, and yet they bless us with their presence and their belonging. When time comes for communion, our practice is to invite everybody to come forward. And those who choose not to receive the Eucharist 
cross of sins in this manner, and we extend to them a welcoming blessing. It's a gesture of hospitality, but far more importantly, it's a statement of respect, respect for the high value and the uniqueness of each person's belief. And therefore, when we pray, the Hindu, the Muslim, the Hebrew, the agnostic, we are all God's people. There are no stepchildren in the house of the Lord. So if you're praying with us and Eucharist is not part of your belief, your practice, we invite you, if you wish, to come with the communicants. And if you will make this gesture, we will happily extend to you a welcoming and respectful blessing. My friends, this is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are we called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word, my soul shall be healed. Okay. 
his hand and he will raise you up on eagle's wings there you are the breath of dawn and make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand
Please stand. And now, my friends, before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother, Peter. May our farewell express our affection for him, may it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we now commend our brother Peter in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he is risen to the fullness of life. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon him in this life, signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servants and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and our brother forever. Peter, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem May the choirs of angels welcome you and lead you to the bosom of Abraham and where Lazarus the beggar is poor no longer, may you find eternal rest. Amen. Let us now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Flights of angels lead you into paradise you want to and follow bring us you into heaven's eternal light. The holy martyrs waiting there to greet you after you pass through heaven. Smiling, 
short is like a morning spring in the lilt of Irish laughter you can hear the angels sing when Irish hearts are happy all the world seems bright and gay and when Irish eyes are smiling sure they'll steal your heart away there's a tear in your eye and I'm wondering why for it never should be there at all with a lilt in your smile sure a stone you'd beguile so there's never a teardrop should fall when your sweet lilting laughter's like some fairy song and your eyes twinkle bright as can be you can laugh all the while and all other times smile so now smile a smile like a morning spring in the lilt of Irish laughter you can hear the angels sing when Irish eyes are happy all the world seems bright and gay and 